Good evening. I have the high honor of introducing our lecturer this evening. Dr. Emily Greenwood studied classics at Cambridge University, where she earned her Bachelor of Arts, Master of Philosophy, and PhD degrees. After teaching classics at the University of St. Andrews, where she was a lecturer in Greek until 2008, she joined the classics department at Yale University in July 2009 where she is professor of classics and director of the undergraduate studies program in classics. Dr. Greenwood's research interests include ancient Greek historiography, Greek prose literature of the fifth and fourth centuries BCE, 20th century classical receptions, especially in Africa, Britain, the Caribbean, and Greece. She's also interested in classics and post-colonialism and the theory and practice of translating the classics of Greek and Roman literature. Dr. Greenwood is the author of several books, including Afro-Greeks, Dialogues Between Anglophone Caribbean Literature and Classics in the 20th Century. Dr. Greenwood is our Martin Luther King Jr. lecturer this evening. Her lecture is titled, Does Classical Rhetoric Still Matter in the Context of Black Lives Matter? Regarding the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s homiletics in 2016. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Emily Greenwood. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for that generous introduction, uh, and thank you to everyone in the audience. Um, I'm particularly grateful to um, President Barnes and Mrs. Barnes for their very kind and courteous hospitality, and to the very warm welcome that the black seminarians have given me to campus. It's very good to be here. So you heard my title, Does Classical Rhetoric Still Matter in the Context of Black Lives Matter? rereading the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr.'s homiletics in 2016. So I start with a pot spoiler. You know I'm a classics professor, so of course the answer to that rhetorical question is yes, a resounding yes, it does matter. But it's one thing to assert it, and it's another thing to persuade, so there will be some content to my talk this evening. <laughs> in book nine of his histories, the Greek historian Herodotus narrates a banquet thrown by a prominent Theban called Thysander of, uh, sorry, a prominent Theban called Atagonus, son of Phrynon. And it's a banquet that's in honor of the Persian army during the second Persian invasion of Greece that took place in the years 480 to 479 BC. The historical date for this banquet is 479, just before the Battle of Plataea, which the Persians would go on to lose. The Theban host for the banquet allegedly arranged the dining couches so that the 50 most prominent Thebans would each share a couch with the 50 most prominent men in the Persian army. Herodotus cites a man called Thysander of Orchomenos as his source, and he says that Thysander told him that during the meal, the Persian who was sharing his couch turned to him and speaking in Greek, crying as he spoke, he predicted defeat for the Persian army of Xerxes. Um, Thysander asked him if he was so sure, why didn't he warn the Persian high command of the likelihood of defeat? To which the Persian replies, and here I quote from book nine of Herodotus's histories, my friend, that which the God has bound to happen it is unfeasible, a merhanon, for a human to avert. For no one is willing to heed even those who speak trustworthy things. Many of us among the Persians understand these things, and yet we follow, bound to necessity. This is the most hateful form of distress that exists for humans, to know many things, but to have power over nothing. There's much to say about this quotation, which resonates with the language of fate and necessity in Greek tragedy. 
but to elaborate would take me too far from my theme. What I will say briefly is that Herodotus seems to be projecting Greek ideas about fate and destiny onto this Persian speaker. Um, because one of the things we know about the Zoroastrian religion of the Persians was that they didn't subscribe to strong ideas of destiny and determination. Individuals in Zoroastrian religion of this time were free to shape their own destiny. So Herodotus is adapting to his Greek context. Within Herodotus's histories, this passage picks up on the fact that Xerxes's uncle, so Xerxes has left the Persian high command in Greece, has retreated back to Sardis in Persia in safety. Um, and before they even embarked on the invasion of Greece, Xerxes's uncle, Artabanus, has given him excellent, historically informed advice saying, don't do it, it's going to be a disaster. And Artabanus reels off all the disasters in Persian military history to tell him why it's a bad idea. But Xerxes overturns his advice, uh, and the device through which that happens is the apparition of a ghost who appears to Xerxes in his sleep uh, and says, the gods will punish you terribly if you don't invade Greece. Um, so what I think Herodotus is encouraging us to do is to think about the speciousness of claims of uh, immovable fate and divine necessity. We're left with big questions in his narrative about whether the dream that appeared to Xerxes is a credible dream and whether we should take it seriously, or whether the dreams are causal pretexts and arguments about immovable fate are causal pretexts dreamt up by humans for their own designs. So I think it's more apt to read the passage from Herodotus as a meditation about the impotence of truth-telling in certain institutional and cultural contexts. The challenge of speaking truth to power, for example, of having a clear sense of the ethics of a situation or the salient context or data or information and yet lacking the ability to persuade, perhaps because of structures of power. This is a scenario for all of us that's ever present, uh, particularly in academic institutions. We ask ourselves on a daily basis, what power to persuade does knowledge have? And what is the relationship between knowledge and structures of power? I don't know how many of you are likely to be wise advisors uh, or specialist consultants to military high command. Perhaps some of you will be, perhaps some of you have already served as pastors to the, the military. But for the purpose of this evening's talk, I'd like to propose a friendly emendation to the text from Herodotus. And the variation goes like this, that the greatest pain is to be in command of knowledge and to lack the words and the verbal felicity to persuade. Then as now, allowing for the historical specifics of different rhetorical cultures, this is the entire challenge of rhetoric, how to persuade an audience. In the context of a talk on King's legacy in a theological seminary, one could short-circuit the discussion by evoking divine inspiration and the question of whether or not King was a prophet. So let me state unequivocally that there is no King without his faith in God and his spiritual calling, and that his rhetoric is profoundly informed and shaped by his faith. But if rhetoric and rhetorical prowess proceeded from faith alone, then there would be no need to study homiletics. And I know from reading your website that you do study homiletics <laughs> and you do it intensively. I quote, this is from your section on practical theology. Every Princeton theological seminary graduate needs to be an effective communicator, whatever his or her vocation, preaching and worship leadership, classroom teaching or leadership through other avenues. So in approaching King and King's rhetoric and homiletics, I'm going to approach it under the title of classical rhetoric with black difference. From Aristotle's politics, classical political thought inherited the hateful anti-human idea that a slave, a doulos, was a living animate possession, a kterma empsikon in Greek. In chapter four of book one of the politics, Aristotle expounds his definition of household property and the slave as a form of property, and I quote, and as in the arts, which have a definite sphere, the workers must have their own proper instruments for the accomplishment of their work, so it is in the management of a household. Now instruments are of various sorts, some are living, others lifeless. In the rudder, the pilot of a ship has a lifeless instrument. 
In the lookout man, he has a living instrument. For in the arts, the servant is a kind of instrument, organon in Greek. Thus, too, a possession is an instrument for maintaining life. And so, in the arrangement of the family, a slave is a kind of living possession, kai hodulos ktema ti empsichon. A property, a number of such instruments, and the servant is himself an instrument for instruments. It's the end of the Aristotle quotation. How can a person be a thing? How can an object be animate and possess a soul? Aristotle has no philosophical proof for this assertion. Instead, he relies on rhetoric, a verbal slate of hand. In the Greek, it's this vague, indefinite little particle, ti, that a doulos ktema ti emsikon is a thing that has a soul, a certain kind of thing. That's the sense of ti. It glosses over the oddity of the very concept of a kind of animate object. And this verbal slight does its argumentative work because later, before he gets to his infamous argument for natural slavery, this is the repugnant argument that there are people who are by nature slaves, Aristotle argues that a human being belongs to another man if he is an object, albeit human. So he has to have uh, laid that groundwork for his reader to accept uh, the notion of a human object. But Aristotle's logic cannot completely ignore the difference between human life and inanimate objects. In another work, The Eudemian Ethics, Aristotle resorts to figurative language, a simile, hospere in Greek, which means just like or as it were, to compare the incomparable. There he writes, the slave is, as it were, a member or tool, organon, of his master, and a tool is a sort of inanimate slave. Well might the philosopher Aristotle vacillate and resort to vague, indefinite pronouns and similes. As the scholar Peter Garnsey notes, Aristotle's living tool seems to have very little that is human about it. The figurative language which Aristotle employs conveys the counter-human unnaturalness of the thought. And we should also note that this idea was counter-cultural in Aristotle's own day. Uh, you know, his was a, an outlying view. The majority of his contemporaries rejected this idea that there were people who by nature uh, belonged to be slaves or were destined to be slaves. In Aristotle's conception of the barbarian slave as an animate possession or an animate tool, we see very early beginnings of a divided social contract in Western philosophy, a contract which has fostered the liberal humanism of some at the expense of the infrahumanity and thingification of others. The philosopher Charles Mills has dubbed this the racial contract. Martin Luther King Jr. himself talks back to this anti-human trope in Aristotle in his lecture, The Ethical Demands for Integration, which was delivered at a church conference in Nashville on the 27th of December, 1962. I quote from King. The tragedy of segregation is that it treats men as means rather than ends, and thereby reduces them to things rather than persons. But a man is not a thing. He must be dealt with not as an animated tool, but as a person sacred in himself. Although not part of a racist apparatus, scholars tend to think about these bigoted Greek views as being proto-racist because they don't map clearly onto uh, the terms of modern racist philosophies. So although not part of that kind of racist apparatus, Aristotle's doctrine was all too easily pressed into racist ideologies by subsequent ages, as we well know. And it's this complex legacy to which the contemporary Black Lives Matter movement speaks. A sympathetic listener or viewer, the Black Lives Matter movement, by which I mean a listener or viewer who has lived, read, and studied modern US history feelingly, comprehends that Black Lives Matter is shorthand for Black Lives Matter too. This listener belongs to a sympathetic interpretative community and can grasp the illocutionary force of this slogan. In other words, this assertion that black lives matter is only necessary because new world slavery prospered through the suppression of the humanity, the suppression of the humanity of enslaved Africans and their descendants, 
and because the American nation was founded on a denial of the humanity of the Negro and the Native American. Sympathetic listeners and viewers see placards and t-shirts and badges, and if they know their modern US history, are able to visualize the photos taken by Ernest Withers on March 28, 1968, to visualize the Memphis sanitation workers marching with the slogans on their placards proclaiming, I am a man. The hostile misreading, which counters Black Lives Matter with a disingenuous claim that all lives matter, is disingenuous because it ignores the fact that the repeated unlawful killing of black men and women makes their citizenship a contested proposition and willfully ignores the intent and history of the slogan that it sets out to critique. This is the force of the title of Claudia Rankine's 214, 2014 prose poem, Citizen, an American Lyric, which if you've seen it, you'll remember, has a picture of a, an empty vacated hoodie on the title, on the cover, which stands in as a referent for Trayvon Martin, as a reminder that in 2012, when Trayvon Martin was killed, and in 2014, when the book was published, and today in 2016, race is still a signifier for citizenship. The rhetorical challenge that Black Lives Matter takes on is how to rhetorically challenge and redeem the thingification, objectification, and treatment of the black body as mere matter. If centuries of rhetorical tradition have made and constructed the black body as matter that does not matter on equal terms to that of other human bodies, what words do we have to unmake this constructed body and to remake it in a positive image and a positive self-image? By constructed body, I'm thinking of Harvey Young's work, his 2010 book, Embodying Black Experience, where he's written about phenomenal blackness, the phenomenon whereby popular connotations of blackness are mapped across or internalized within black people, resulting in the construction of the black body and a slippage between an abstraction, a black body, a racialized projection, and the materiality of the bodies that we all possess. So this is what I'll call rhetoric with black difference. The way in which rhetoric in black traditions has a specific relation to experience. Here I'm thinking in classical rhetorical theory of the Latin noun res, the substance or experience or matter to which you apply verba, the words, or the style, or the tropes of rhetoric. The narrator of the St. Lucian poet, Derek Walcott's poem, The Schooner Flight, which was first published in 1979, is a character named Shabin. Shabin meditates on the condition of post-colonial history in the Caribbean, in which the experience and perspectives of whole peoples has been erased in the official colonial histories. Shabin imagines an encounter with history, which he personifies as a parchment creole, someone of European descent born in the New World, and he asks history to recognize his paternity. He walks up to history and says, Sir Shabin, they say I is your grandson. You remember grandma, your black cook, at all? History says nothing to him, just spits by way of reply. To which Shabin comments, A spit like that, worth any number of words, but that's all them bastards have left us, words. Throughout post-colonial literature, this refrain, that's all the bastards have left us, words, is the refrain of the dispossessed of empire. It's a claim that harks back to Caliban's curses in Shakespeare's play, The Tempest, where the benefit conferred by the colonizer's language is the ability to curse them in it. So there Caliban says, you taught me language and my profit on tis I know to curse. The red plague rid you for learning me your language. Closer to home, Shabin's gripe recalls Aimé Césaire's notebook of a return to my native land, first published in 1939, which imagines modern colonized subjects identifying themselves defeatedly as mumblers of words, only for the narrator to launch into a neologistic, pyroclastic, world-making tour de force, meditating on the elemental power of these words. And I quote from Césaire, Vainly, in the tepidity of your throat, you ripen for the twentieth time the same indigent solace that we are mumblers of words. Words? 
while we handle quarters of earth, while we wed delirious continents, while we force steaming gates, Words, ah yes, words, but words of fresh blood, words that are tidal waves and erysipelas, malarias and lava and brush, fires and blazes of fresh and blazes of cities. Why the massive elemental pyroclastic outpouring of words in Césaire? Mostly to overpower the centuries of literature that described the African and proscribed the humanity of the black subject. So this is Césaire again. And this land, Martinique, colonial Martinique, screamed for centuries that we are bestial brutes, that the human pulse stops at the gates of the slave compound, that we are walking compost, hideously promising tender cane and silky cotton. And they would brand us with red hot irons on the town square, and an L of English cloth and salted meat from Ireland cost less than we did. And this land was calm, tranquil, repeating the spirit of the Lord was in its acts. We don't have to look far in Caribbean literature to find limits to this exuberant confidence in language as the last vestige of agency. In her essay, The Absence of Writing, or How I Almost Became a Spy, the Trinidadian Tobagonian writer, Marlene Nobese Philip, introduces an intersectional edge when she writes of the Caribbean women writer being a squatter in the language a squatter in the English language, a language which, in her words, expresses the non-being of the African. For the Caribbean woman writer, the English language is a source of anguish. As Walcott's character Shabin puts it in his poem, we live like our names, and you would have to be colonial to know the difference, to know the pain of history words contain. All of the protests for greater diversity and inclusion that took place on US campuses last semester revolved around the failure of our educational institutions to better model sympathetic interpretative communities. Interpretative communities that suffer and feel along with everyone in them and which have the emotional imagination to understand in Walcott's words the pain of history that words contain. In an essay which he contributed to Harper's Magazine in 1961, entitled The Dangerous Road Before Martin Luther King, James Baldwin characterized King's greatness as a speaker in similar terms, and I quote, the secret, the secret to King's greatness and success, lies, I think, in his intimate knowledge of the people he is addressing, be they black or white, and in the forthrightness with which he speaks of those things which hurt and baffle them. He does not offer an easy comfort and this keeps his hearers absolutely tense. He allows them their self-respect. Indeed, he insists on it. This is where King and classical rhetoric comes in. I'd like to make it clear that in evoking classical rhetoric, I don't mean to imply for a second that it was a definitive influence on Martin Luther King Jr.'s oratory. Instead, I follow King's scholarship of the last 25 years in recognizing the example and the manifest influence of contemporary Christian homiletics, whether heard in churches or distributed on the radio or through magazines and newspapers, as being a formative influence and simultaneously the influence of the black folk pulpit and the black folk tradition as seminal, all-pervasive influence on King's rhetoric. Instead, I introduce classical rhetoric because, in the first place, it offers us an instructive analogy for understanding and analyzing the function of King's rhetoric, and also because I include King himself within this canon of classical rhetoric. King's speeches are exemplary for all would-be orators in the same way that a Demosthenes was exemplary for a Cicero, a Cicero for a Washington or a Churchill. The historical memory of King is rightly yoked to his message of nonviolent civil disobedience. But tonight I'd like to focus briefly on the force and violence of language in King's oratory and writings. By this I'm not thinking of sheer force in rhetorical delivery. In Greek and Roman rhetorical theory, bia in Greek or wis in Latin tend to be um, more negative than positive qualities that have a tendency uh, to characterize demagogic oratory. When in his life of the famous Athenian politician and orator Demosthenes, which he wrote uh, towards the end of the first century CE, 
Plutarch tells us that the Macedonian king Philip, Demosthenes' great adversary, used to say, and I'm quoting Plutarch, that the speeches of Demosthenes were like soldiers because of their warlike power. Any violence implied here is purely metaphorical. In a similar vein, I'm thinking of the power, force, and efficacy of King's rhetoric that he was able to deploy in lieu of an army in a social struggle and movement which this very rhetoric brought into being. In contemporary social movements, as you know, King's status is ambivalent. In Michael Dyson's 2000 book, I May Not Get There With You, the true Martin Luther King Jr., Dyson writes against the nostalgic image of King and outdates him, that outdates him as a figure from history rather than as a figure in a continuing historical struggle. Dyson ends his book with a poignant anecdote narrated by Rosa Parks, recalling how already in 1965, in the march from Selma to Montgomery, she was invisible to the emerging generation of young activists and was literally sidelined, having to fight her way in and through the march to make it to Montgomery. Then there's the argument that the discourse and rhetoric of King's sermons, speeches, and writings is outmoded and that it's not salient to the politics of the present and the complex intersectional identities of modern protest movements. Understandably, there are exclusions in King. I, as a reader, have to adjust constantly to King's use of a normative masculine gender where the man is the presumed subject of the struggle. And in keeping with the prevailing sexual politics of the Christian church and the nation in the 1950s and 1960s, there's no expression of fellow feeling with gay or queer citizens. And the Southern Christian League Conference, we know, kept James Baldwin at arm's length with King's consent because of Baldwin's sexuality. But I also find in King's sermons and writings the authority to expand and adapt their message, which is immovably a message of love and inclusivity and an untiring repudiation of injustice that cannot and must not abide discrimination. Lastly, within the black church, there's a debate about what mode of political rhetoric and spiritual leadership is pertinent to and adequate for the present. And in this debate, King is often styled as the august but removed elderly patriarch, the Moses figure to a Joshua generation. In African-American studies, I also note the increasing marginalization of King. In 2014, my colleague at Yale, Anthony Reed, published an excellent book entitled Freedom Time, The Poetics and Politics of Black Experimental Writing. In his analysis, Anthony Reed um, looks at avant-garde black experimental writing from the 1960s and examines it as a renegotiation of blackness and the black experience through experiments in aesthetic form, where radical creative freedom authorizes the self-making and political freedom of writers and artists who self-identify as black. But it strikes me that Anthony Reed's vision remains a messianic vision of writing towards a time of freedom that is yet to come and of trying to write that freedom into existence through bold experiments with form. I'll suggest that this project of experimentally writing and speaking freedom is fully continuous with King's project and King's radical imagination. In post-colonial studies, King's dialogue with larger anti-colonial struggles is sidelined, downplaying the importance and influence of the civil rights movements on the international stage. Yes, King and other civil rights leaders were influenced by Indian and African liberation struggles. King himself pointed to this vector of influence in his article, The Time for Freedom Has Come, published in the New York Times magazine in September 1961. King remarked, and I quote, the liberation struggle in Africa has been the single, greatest single international influence on American Negro students. Frequently I hear them say that if their African brothers can break the bonds of colonialism, surely the American Negro can break Jim Crow. But this influence was two directional. Chief Albert Latuli, who became president of the South African African National Congress in 1952, and who was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1961, three years before the prize was awarded to King in 1964, 
often spoke of the importance of King's writings for the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa. Nelson Mandela, as you're probably aware, quoted Martin Luther King Jr. in his speech of inauguration as president of South Africa in 1994, and cites King in his autobiography, Long Walk to Freedom. But contemporary cultural studies scholarship has little place for the spiritual struggle at the heart of the civil rights struggle. It's an oversight that's hard to square with accounts of South African prisoners sentenced to death in Pretoria's central prison, singing to each other from their cells all through the night, the night before a hanging was due to take place, singing hymns in Zulu or Xhosa, or the ANC's resistance anthem, Nkosi Sikeleli Afrika, a song of resistance that had its distant origins in a Welsh missionary hymn. Contemporaneously on the other side of the Atlantic, the hymns that were a sole vehicle for the civil rights struggle need a part in the post, the cultural studies explanations of post-colonial politics. Here is King in the prophetic sermon, I See the Promised Land, delivered in Memphis on the 3rd of April, 1968, the day before he was assassinated in support of the striking sanitation workers. King looks back on the protests in Birmingham of the 1960s. These are famous words, strong words. I remember in Birmingham, Alabama, when we were in that majestic struggle where we would move out of the 16th Street Baptist Church day after the day. By the hundreds, we would move out, and Bull Connor would tell them to send the dogs forth, and they did come, but we just went before the dogs singing, ain't gonna let nobody turn me round. Bull Connor next would say, turn the fire hoses on, and I said to you the other night, Bull Connor didn't know history, he knew a kind of physics that somehow didn't relate to the trans physics that we knew about. And that was the fact that there was a certain kind of fire no water could put out. And we went before the fire hoses. We had known water. If we were Baptist or some other denomination, we had been immersed. If we were Methodist and some others, we had been sprinkled. But we knew water. That couldn't stop us. And we just went on before the dogs and we would look at them. And we'd go on before the water hoses and we would look at it and we'd just go on singing, over my head I see freedom in the air. This oversight and failure to connect with the spiritual message of King's writings is well articulated by Robin Kelly in the book Freedom Dreams, The Black Radical Imagination, published in 2002, a book that had its origins in a Martin Luther King lecture delivered at Dartmouth in the year 2000. Kelly describes his own belated realization, and I quote, that the most radical art is not protest art, but works that take us to another place, works that envision a different way of seeing, perhaps a different way of feeling. Freedom and love may be the most revolutionary ideas available to us, and yet as intellectuals, we failed miserably to grapple with their political and analytical importance. Despite having spent a decade and a half writing about radical social movements, I'm only just beginning to see what animated, motivated, and knitted together these gatherings of aggrieved folk. I've come to realize that once we strip radical social movements down to their bare essence, and understand the collective desires of people in motion, freedom, and love, we see that these lay at the very heart of the matter. I know that this is no surprise to any of you. Profound and radical possibilities are at the heart of this seminary. King's sermon, I See the Promised Land, contained an exhortation to develop a dangerous kind of unselfishness, the kind of dangerous unselfishness that regarded one's own body and life as alienable in a non-violent but dynamic and non-passive struggle for the supposedly unalienable rights enshrined in the Declaration of Independence. The exhortation to develop a dangerous kind of unselfishness looks back to the resilience of the protesters in Alabama and the violence and deaths that they sustained, and it looks forward to King's probable death in the struggle. Following David Scott's work, Conscripts of Modernity, scholarship on anti- and post-colonial freedom struggles is attuned to the importance of narrative and form 
and the manipulation of temporality in colonial resistance movements. Scott considers the pattern whereby many nations have adopted tragedy in their national histories as the pattern of implotment for what happens after independence. And it's a, you know, literally a, a tragic uh, sequence where the tragedy of empire and colonialism seeds to a new dawn and an era of hope that is then displaced and supplanted by an adapted tragedy uh, in subsequent governments. For his own version of anti-colonial resistance, King chooses not tragedy, but epic, and particularly the biblical epic of Exodus. In the speech, The Rising Tide of Racial Consciousness, which King delivered at the Golden Anniversary Conference of the National Urban League on September the 6th, 1960, this is how he described the work of the students who led the lunch counter sit-ins in Greensboro, North Carolina in February 1960. These young students have taken the deep groans and passionate yearnings of the Negro people and filtered them in their own souls and fashioned them in a creative protest which is an epic known all over our nation. The tensions and disagreements that emerge between the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and the Southern Christian League Conference are well documented. But here King is keen to recognize this student movement as its own original creative work, a national epic, a movement which is simultaneously a consummate aesthetic work, identified with epic, the genre of genres, as well as a consummate manifestation and monument of political struggle, which is epic in scale. To underscore the point, King repeats the detail about epic. He says, I am convinced that future historians will have to record this student movement as one of the greatest epics of our heritage. But crucially important at the same time is the inscription of this creative protest in the tradition of the black historical experience in America and in black song culture, including the spiritual sorrow songs which, which, which Du Bois concludes the souls of black folk and about which uh, Professor Pierce has written. Um, King, you know, talking about the student process, claims they have taken the deep groans and passionate yearnings of the Negro people and filtered them in their own souls. The student's creativity is inspired by the black tradition, as was King himself in every single rhetorical utterance. Within debates, and their necessary and important debates, about King's use of others' works and words, the so-called voice merging, it's easy to lose sight of King's incessant innovation. I'm not talking about extemporaneous improvisation, although King does that as well, most famously in the speech, I Have a Dream, where although he'd rehearsed it in other contexts, the dream sequence was improvised on the occasion. Instead, I'm talking about King's rhetorical verbal struggle every time he spoke to improvise in the sense of its Latin etymology, improvisus, which means unforeseen, things that are not foreseen. And in that sense, King, every time he speaks, improvises in trying to lead his audience into an unseen, unknowable future on the substance of hope and the evidence of faith, the evidence of things not seen of Hebrews 11. I'm talking about King's struggle that is at the inception of the black radical imagination in this country and that continues as the inheritance of the radical black imagination today. This is a radical imagination because it has to imagine from its roots, radix in Latin is a root, it has to imagine from its roots a dreamed, imagined national community that has excluded and occluded the Negro and the Native American who were only included as haunting marginal shadows. How does King do this? How does he perform this radical imagination? In his study of King's rhetoric on freedom, the scholar Gary Selby draws on Michael Calvin McGee's analysis of social movements as rhetorical constructions. And by this, McGee meant movements whose meaning is created by narrative argument and form. As Selby summarizes it, Persuasive discourse is the primary agency through which social movements transform perceptions of reality. 
He then has recourse to theories of anthropology, theories of Victor Turner, to talk about social and ritual drama. So in Selby's analysis, we have rhetoric constructing a social movement, working in close collaboration with social ritual, where the march provides the dramatic enactment that fulfills and provides the telos of the speech. So Selby's analysis gives us this very strong speech, march, speech structure, where every speech uh, mobilizes a march and inspires the marches. And um, the march is then the dramatization and proof of the speech, the bringing out into the open of what is uh, not seen and only heard about, and then another speech marks the end of the ritual drama. If we start with Selby's insight into the um, idea about social movements and rhetoric and creating social movements, we can then think about Judith Hoover's work where she's analyzed King's letter from Birmingham jail in the context of the rhetorical situation. This is the theory um, that holds uh, Leo Bit Lloyd Bitzer's theory that there are such things as uh, phenomenally existing situations that call forth a rhetorical response. And um, she notes how this was countered by the argument that actually no, the rhetorical situation is purely manufactured by rhetoric itself. The Greek orator Demosthenes, who I mentioned already, is a past master of the invention of the rhetorical situation. He's a past master of the rhetoric of Kairos, uh, which you're familiar with, I think, in the context of homiletics, although in classical Greek theory it means something a little different. Kairos is the right time or the opportunity, um, uh, the opportune situation, and it has related constructs, eukairia, the good or right time, and akairia, untimeliness. So Demosthenes starts most of his political speeches in the Athenian assembly, telling his audience that it's the kairos, that they absolutely have to act. The present situation, I'm quoting him, the kairos, more than any other previous one, requires much thought and deliberation, but I do not consider it particularly difficult to advise you what to do in our current situation. Kairos cannily frames a politician's speech as a timely intervention that is held out as offering a solution to a critical situation. The language of Kairos, if embedded in a cogent rhetorical performance, is self-fulfilling. To name something a crisis immediately makes it so. This is the challenge that was mounted against the idea that there are these pre-existing situations. And Judith Hoover suggested this is exactly what King does in the letter from Birmingham jail. King invites us to take this interpretation himself writing, you may well ask, why direct action? Why sit-ins? Why marches? Isn't negotiation a better path? You're exactly right in your call for negotiation. Indeed, this is the purpose of direct action. Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and establish such creative tension that a community that has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks to dramatize the issue so it, then, it can no longer be ignored. So the purpose of direct action is to create a situation so crisis-packed that it will inevitably open the door to negotiation. In ancient Greek, the concepts of kairos, opportunity, and right time is closely related to the concept of krisis, uh, judgment, discernment, and deliberation. So naming something as a kairos forces your audience to choose, to legislate, to judge, to take action, to enact crisis. And we see this with King's construction of urgency across his whole oeuvre, particularly his written speeches and his sermons. The construction of a kairos that opens a pivot or opens the door for a radically reimagined freedom time, which is simultaneously historical and apocalyptical. We see, and I'm going to end very soon, we see, I think, best the fierce insistency of King's manipulation of temporality in how he constructs nowness and urgency. And instead of taking Kairos as one single instance, instead of taking any given tragedy uh, in the civil rights struggle and using that as the Kairos on which to premise all action, King, I think, in a, a, a genius move, takes uh, a pivotal, 
a moment, a critical moment in human time, and it's an iterative moment, and that's the moment of midnight, this pivot hinge, uh, the time of preparation, the time when King was often up writing some of those 300 speeches that he gave every year, uh, meditating, praying, worrying over the struggle. And this um, is utterly uh, contemporaneous with freedom at midnight and the idea of midnight as the, the kairos that will determine the future of nations as they struggled for independence. Freedom at midnight becomes the slogan across the British Empire for the granting of independence. So King constructs urgency, he constructs now, uh, you'll recall how often his speeches reiterate the theme that now is the time, the fierce urgency of now, how long, the sense of uh, overtime, of uh, overlonging, the hour is late, the clock of destiny is ticking on, all of these motifs, and then King laces that in to midnight uh, as the, the kairos that's repeated, um, that speaks of the suffering of history, but also suggests the moment of intervention where the next day might be different. To conclude, I've taken you, I know, and thank you for your patience, on a long and winding, meandering path down many different routes of argument. I think that all these different routes converge on a single realization, and that this is the discipline of classical rhetoric, by which I absolutely mean King's rhetoric as well and its exemplarity. The discipline of classical re rhetoric is an urgent and indispensable tool for the struggles of the present. In ancient Rome, disciplina, disciplina, discipline is part of the training of the orator. It's all the hours that you spend modeling, writing speeches on the basis of good models. It's all the hours that you spend exercising your voice and dieting so you can hold forth in public for hours on end. Disciplina is the languages that you learn, it's the tropes and the topoi, so you have that well-timed versatility that is ready and adequate for any occasion. The immense labor that all of this discipline, disciplina, implies is in preparation and anticipation for the moments of potential intervention when your words just might make a critical distance, difference. It's about preparedness and readiness so that unlike Herodotus's unnamed Persian speaker, you're not left feeling possessed of insight but lacking the rhetorical ability to persuade your audiences. As we've seen in the case of Black Lives Matter, the rhetorical invention of this slogan, devastating in its simplicity, is not enough. It also needs rhetorical arguments and prowess to persuade and or refute the detractors of the movement. And without the right words to define it, there is no sense of urgency and no impetus for change. Thank you. <laughs>